Um, we're here today to talk about some of the discoveries um, that were made uh, during the final slow water services upgrade and town enhancement scheme um, that took place between 2018 and uh, 2021. At the last session, we spoke about the later medieval burials that were found on Society Street. And these burials appear to be associated with a well and a well house. And there's also some um, evidence um, for an enclosure or a fence, which is likely to have marked the extent of the cemetery. So it's likely too that this cemetery was associated with the church, uh, which is one of the forerunners of the present day uh, St. John's on the top of Church Hill. Um, we also had a look at a set of rosary beads, um, which was found in one of the burials. Um, so that, that set of rosary beads is likely to date to the 15th century, or sorry, the 16th century. And as you can see here, a replica of the beads was made uh, by Mr. Vicky Coolan of the Bangor Slow Men's Shed. So after the talk today, they will be formally presented to the library um, for display. So um, I suppose as we finish the last session on a religious note, uh, we might start with the same this afternoon. Um, many of you might remember the construction of St. Joseph's Place, um, the housing estate during the 1950s. So this estate was built on the site of a church and graveyard uh, which was levelled during the construction works at that time. The damage was reported to the National Museum of Ireland and the site was subsequently visited by Professor Joseph Rafter. Although details are sparse, and that's basically because of the damage that was caused at the time, uh, Rafter reported that a number of in situ burials, so by in situ I mean burials that were as they had they been put at the time, so in situ uh, burials were still visible. He noted that they were extended, which means stretched flat out, and supine laid in their back and aligned west-east. And that's exactly the same as the burials in Society Street were. A number of artifacts uh, were found as well. So part of a spiral ring-headed pin was found inside one of the skulls, um, and a work bronze bar, which may be an unfinished pin shaft, was discovered beside another. So spiral-headed ring pins can be dated uh, pretty accurately to the 16th, 17th century. So it indicates that the site of St. Joseph's was a very, very early ecclesiastical site indeed. So the, the slide there behind me um, shows a, a ring pin. Now, it's not the one from Bannon, so but it could give you an idea of the, the kind of artifact that was found. So Father Egan, um, the, the, he wrote the book on the, the parish of Bannon, so he recorded that a harp peg and a spindle coil were also found. And these give a really good idea of the kind of activity that was carried on up at that site. So a harp peg obviously is associated with the harp, which is associated with music. And then the spindle coil is um, an object that's used um, for, um, for making wool. Um, so you know, it, it's quite interesting uh, that they were found there. So, Father Egan also noted that there was no awareness of the existence of this site beforehand. But um, being the great researcher that he was, um, he found um, an area marked Caltra Ord on a 17th century map of the area, which you can see in the slide there. So it's just, can you see what garbage he has marked on it? Um, you can see garbage is indicated, and Caltra Ord is just above it. So Caltra, as most of you probably know already, is a, is a an Irish word which means uh, children's burial ground. It's another word like Killy um, that we use today, and or this height, so it's the height of the, the children's burial ground. So very often, as you probably also know, so these monuments, these children's burial grounds, were located on earlier sites or earlier monuments, and that seems to have been the case there. And some of you may also remember the excavation of the Ring Fort and Sutering in Matney. Um, as part of the uh, motorway works in 2005. I think a few people actually got up to, to visit it. Well, it's likely that that site and the um, ecclesiastical site in St. Joseph's um, coexisted at least for a period of time. So, uh, why am I talking about St. Joseph's? Well, as part of our project, the plan was to upgrade the water services on the estate. And because of the discoveries in the 1950s, uh, my colleague Angela Wallace from Atlantic Archaeology went in and put in some exploratory trenches to determine if the scheme would impact any surviving below-ground remains. 
Um, so Bernie actually worked on that project as well. So she discovered that some human remains were still present. Uh, based on that, the project, uh, the scheme actually had to be re redesigned, although a small number of burials had to be excavated afterwards. And a fragment of human bone from one of the burials has been radiocarbon dated to between 530 and 650 AD, which confirms that the site has been used during the early medieval period. So we're going to jump ahead now about a thousand years and come down the town, as the man says, and have a look at one of the oldest structures in the town itself. So Ballinasol Bridge, as it was known, was built in two phases and is remarkably still the main access in and out of the town. Um, work began on it, the first phase of work, I suppose, began on it in 1570. It was commissioned by Sir, Sir Henry Sidney, um, who was the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland at the time. And that's his portrait there behind me in all his, his finery. So it was completed then under the charge of Sir Nicholas Mulby in 1579. So Mulby, I don't know whether you're interested in him, but he was a, basically a soldier from Yorkshire and a profiteer, and he was part of the Elizabethan court. Now, he was appointed president of Connacht by uh, Sydney, um, which was kind of a strategic, um, a strategic appointment. We know that the bridge had been completed by 1579 because written orders to be observed by Malby were signed by Elizabeth I in May of that year. So in the document she instructed um, him that a bridge had been lately made at Ballinasloe over the River of Suck at our charges, which meant that the Crown paid for it. So the castle there should be continued in our hands, being the common passage into Galway. So Elizabeth instructed him, we will you to keep it in our use with the ward therein. So the ward that, um, that he installed there was Anthony Brabazon. Um, there's actually a nameplate being still on the, the wall inside so there, um, uh, with, with his name on it. So he was the English governor of Hannah, but he was also Malby's uh, son-in-law. He was married to Malby's daughter, uh, Ursula. And it's no coincidence that Elizabeth wanted to keep the castle and the bridge as Ballinasloe was a strategic entry point into the province of Connacht. So I just want to show you before we move on to the next slide. So that's obviously Sir Henry Sidney. But this is a very bad photograph and I have to apologise for it. It just didn't um, show up the way I wanted it to. But that's uh, one of the Tudor arches that's associated with the bridge. So the, the bridge, the Tudor bridge, is basically, as you're going out of the town, it's on the left-hand side um, of the road, and, and there, there are a number of surviving Tudor arches there. Um, and I know it's a Tudor arch because of the shape of it, the shape of the arch itself, and it's very, very low as well. So, um, as I said, it's no coincidence, there's no coincidence that Elizabeth wanted to keep the castle and bridge as Ballinasloe was a strategic entry point into the province of Connacht. So 300 years earlier, for example, Turlough O'Connor, the King of Connacht and High King of Ireland, had a stronghold here. Um, the Anglo-Normans also recognised the, the strategic location of the early settlement and built a castle on the eastern bank of the river in 1245. And it formed part of the manor um, granted to Sir Richard de Rappel, the Norman Lord, in 1253. So a manor is an administrative unit um, that was it's associated with the Normans. So it was most likely replaced by O'Kelly Castle in the 14th century, and then in the 16th century it was taken over by Ewan Burke at the Earl of Clamley Court. Now, um, circa 1754, so a couple of hundred years later, the bridge was widened. Um, so it was basically doubled in size, I suppose. And it extended as well, in case you don't know that, it extended from what's now Dolan's in as far as um, Colbert's in at the bottom of um, bottom Main Street, in Bridge Street. So it was widened, as I said, in the, the mid 18th century, circa uh, 1754. And it was reported in Faulkner's Dublin Journal in September of that year that work on the bridge on the Ross Common side of the town, because the river at that time marked the boundary between the two counties. Um, uh, the work had commenced on the 18th of May and was completed uh, by September of that year. The length, the overall length of the bridge was nearly 300 metres and it was four and a half metres wide. So as I said, it was almost double the size of the, 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 the Tudor Bridge. 
um, to complete that work as well in that, that time frame and with the materials that were available. There's no mean feat really uh, when you think about it. And also the fact that you know the bridge is there today, we're still crossing it, we're still using it. Um, so the a section I wouldn't say really was replaced, but the bridge was kind of, a new bit of the bridge was built up by the River Sub Drainage Board then in 1887. So it's kind of just slightly off the line of the older bridge. Um, and, you know, obviously the bridge has been impacted uh, subsequently by those milling, um, mill races and um, the construction of Shina Howland as well uh, removed a section of it. So um, again, when we're talking about the bridge, well, during the project, we discovered that the bridge extended a little further than is visible above the ground today. So you can see some of the slides there are going to show um, what we discovered. So on one side, uh, we have uh, this cobbled surface, cobbled or metal surface. It was very worn and it was located about one meter below uh, the present ground level. So that was the road surface that was associated with the Tudor Bridge. And then you can see on the other photograph here, uh, sorry, I'm very conscious that you might be able to hear me when I move around, but you can see the wall there. Um, so that's part of the, let's say, the outer wall of the bridge that, that you can't see, and the, the, the 1754 bridge then is added to the other side of that. So and as well as that, uh, more work is being carried out on that bridge now, or it's proposed for that bridge, sadly not by me, um, but hopefully the results will throw some more light on has to one will throw more light on what has to be one of the, the treasures of the town, really. It's not every town that would have uh, a Tudor bridge. So um, we'll move up the town now, I suppose, uh, up the street, and have a look at some of the artefacts that were found. So a 17th century coin and a trade token uh, were found associated with an old street layer, and um, coincidentally just outside the, uh, the present credit union uh, on Main Street. Um, so we might have yeah, such a coincidence. So we might talk about the coin first, I suppose. Um, you can see it there. So uh, these are obviously two sides of the same coin. So one is the obverse, which is this one, and this is the reverse then. So um, the legend on the obverse side of the coin, um, which is a James II half crown, is inscribed Jacobus Rex de Gratia. So basically, a James King by the grace of God. So that inscription encloses the king's head, as you can see there, you can see that uh, in profile, and he's wearing a laurel wreath. Um, and then on the reverse side, so on the other side, uh, the legend basically, it, the date 1690 is on, and the date basically translates as um, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. So the inscription encloses a crown and scepter, which were the symbols of, kin of kingship. And there's three X's um, just above it. So three X's means that it's the, the value of the detach was 30 pence or a half crown. And the date um, of issue was May 1690. You can see May, you can just up above it as well. Sorry, May, just written under it, beg your pardon. And then JR or IR for the activist Rex, so James, uh, King James on, on either side of that. Um, so the inscriptions then of the coin, they're both enclosed by a pearl decoration. But I don't know if you've noticed that this one here, the upper side of it, is um, it's struck just off centre. Um, it didn't quite uh, hit the mark. So these coins were commonly referred to as gun money, and they were minted at presses in both Dublin and Cable Street and in Limerick uh, by the forces of James II during the Rhinomite War which was fought in Ireland between uh, 1689 and 1691. So it culminated um, in the Battle of Ockham, which was fought in July of that year. The name gun money is thought to originate from the idea that they were first struck from metal obtained from obsolete field cannon, but it's now known that many other metal objects, such as church bells, pots, pans, and scrap metal, and so on, were also used. James II, simply did not have the means to fund a war when he landed in Ireland, and he did not wish to antagonise his royal subjects here by imposing tax increases. So one of his advisors, William Bromfield, suggested that he issue coins in a base method such as copper, pewter, or brass, and promised to pay by exchanging them for their value in silver following his expected victory. 
Uh, since James lost the war, uh, the promised exchange never actually took place, and the coins remained in circulation, they say, up until the 18th century. So the next slide, then, is showing the trade tokens. So this is quite interesting. Uh, and actually, you can see the inscription uh, much more clearly on it. Um, it was another form of coinage uh, produced privately in response to a scarcity of official currency during the latter half of the 17th century. So this small token, that's only two centimetres in diameter, um, was found in Balmas, so it has the value of one penny, and it bears the legend, Michael Cantwell, so you can see that on one side, the side the obverse side, Michael Cantwell, with the initials MC and one D for one penny. Um, the reverse side then is, I think you can read that quite clearly, it says Albert Marchand, so M-A-R-C-H-A-N-G, so merchant. Um, and you can see the coat of arms as well of the Cantwell family. The edge of uh, the token is stamped on both sides with this dentine decoration. And as, as was the case with the, the James II gun money, it, it was meant, uh, minted off centre as well. So an identical token held in the British Museum um, is dated to between 1649 and 1672. And T.L. Cook, Thomas Lowell Cook, who was a great historian from Burr, um, he um, lists the Cantor tokens as one of seven struck in bar in the 17th century. I have to say there were coins, or trade tokens were also struck in Ballon Slow, um, I think by a man called Salmon, yeah, um, coincidentally in the, in the post office um, uh, in the 17th century as well. We didn't find any of those, but they are, they are in existence. So that takes us on up the town um, uh, to uh, St. Michael's Square. And um, in August 2018, uh, the remains of a large building were uncovered there uh, during works. And a second section then was found uh, during paving works in June 2019. So the building was made, as you can see from the slides there, from a local limestone. Um, so, um, I hope you can see it, the photos aren't that great really on the slides, but um, you can see that when made from local limestone, there's a plinth with um, a masonry walls. Um, you can see that there, a nice line of plinth uh, underneath it. So if you want to go to the next one. Yeah. So you can see um, that it had basically a cobbled flag floor. So these are cobbled stones that were put down by hand and limestone flags, then large limestone flags. Um, the next one then going outside, yeah, so it's just, they're just examples of the flags. Um, the one after that, yeah. yeah. So you can see this one of the rooms or stalls that was in the building. Um, and you can see that the walls were built to courses, which means one block on top of the other. And um, there's actually traces of a lime uh, render on the inside of it. That's that kind of yellowy, pinky kind of colour. The, uh, the back wall. And during the excavation of it, we found numerous fragments of modern pottery, a huge amount of glass, mainly bottles, and um, animal bone. So, what was it? Uh, what, what did we hit upon? Um, well, we were scratching our heads for a while, I can tell you one, but it turns out that these were the remains of the market house. And without exaggeration, I have to say, this is a building with one of the most interesting histories in the town. It was built by the Earl of Clancarty, most likely in the later part of the 18th century, and it was enlarged and altered sometime after 1836. So, in the sketch or in the print, you can, or the, the slide you can see behind me, it's a print um, which is held by the National Library of Ireland, um, and this shows what the original structure would have looked like. Um, so, you can see that it's a two story rectangular building. Um, with a hipped roof and an unenclosed bell tower complete with bell. Unenclosed just means you could see the bell through it. Um, and the building retained a number of simplified neoclassical ornaments, including pediments, which are the triangular uh, forms, on the triangular decorations on it, and a round-headed window. Now that round-headed window in that um, drawing is very interesting because there's an identical one in what's we would call Calories House there, just on, on Bridge Street, it's a um, common house. So that house actually dates to about 1780, so it kind of gives us a good idea of the age of the, the original phase of the market house. Um, so we know that the, 
majority of market houses were built between 1750 and 1850. Um, and there are some similarities as well, I should say, to that um, building in the sketch and uh, phases of the market house in West Common Town, which you might be uh, familiar with. Um, that was designed by the architect John Ensor in, in the 1760s. Um, and it's actually worth going over because the building has been restored um, and it's in use. Um, and I should say as well, when I first looked at that sketch, I actually thought that it was the aspect of it was taken from, let's say, the bank corner looking down the square. But I actually had a look at it again, and I think it's the reverse that it was taken from the bottom of the square looking up towards the town. So if you look really closely at it, you can see that there's a church in the background. Can you see that in the top? Um, the top right hand corner. Um, there's a church in the background and it has a very distinctive spire. So I think that that is the Board of First Fruits Church which preceded St. John's Church. And the spire of that, most of you will probably know already, um, is the obelisk in Garden. It was taken there following the fire. The church was built in 1811 and I think it um, was destroyed by fire sometime in the 1840s. The spire was taken up to Garden where it's, it's still there. Um, and the inscription is still on today. So it's, it's kind of nice because it's one of the only um, drawings uh, of it that, that, that survives, really. Um, the houses on the left of the sketch were demolished in the 1950s, as you know, to make way for the post office and the aircon uh, place in the square. And what's interesting about that drawing as well is there's a gas light um, just in the centre, and Titan Glockman in his book says that Balanslow was one of the first towns in Ireland to have, um, to have public lighting, which was fueled by gas. Um, I think the gas works, if I'm not mistaken, is up in the area around um, uh, the Shearwater, the Shearwater Hotel at the back of that area. So, market houses then, uh, they were regarded as something of a status symbol uh, for landlords, keen to show how interested they were in civic improvement. But in reality, um, they were a source of revenue for an estate. Uh, they're often referred to as toll cells, a word which originally meant tax hall. So if you have any of you have been to Kilkenny, you know that there's a store toll cell there in, in Dublin as well. In fact, in many towns around the country. So these toll cells or market houses would have been the centre of the local economy and the hub of any commercial activity um, in the town, particularly on market days. So the ground floor, as we saw in the sketch from the National Library, it typically provided a covered area for traders and the upper floor often functioned as a courthouse or a jail or a town hall or a meeting place. Now that wasn't the case in Balance though because we actually had a courthouse and jail here in the 18th century. Um, and as well as that in the early days of public transport the distance between towns was measured from market house to market house as well. Um, if any of you are familiar with the tail and skinner maps you can, you can see them on that. So the next slide then shows a very different market house. So this was following um, uh, alterations that were undertaken in the 19th century, as I said. Um, the upper floor with its bell tower and bell had been removed and replaced with parallel roofed buildings with open stalls. You can see that on, on the right hand side. Um, you know, open stalls um, and a, a place basically then a yard at the front. Um, where you could sell their wares, and the women in the picture were selling um, potatoes and fish. Um, the sign between the two buildings reads L. Ward, Carpenter, Oak and Deal Coffins, a speciality. So you can see that L. Ward had a, a prime position situated between the two churches um, for his trade. And some of you probably know more about L. Ward than I was able to find out. Um, and you can see in the background then St. Michael's Church, um, which was designed by the great church architect Augustus Pugin in the, the, the mid-19th century. That's down at the opposite end of the square. So the market house enjoyed a considerable <coughs> reputation in the town in the late 19th century, although it wasn't a positive one. There are several accounts in contemporary newspapers, far too many to go into here, reporting on what was referred to as a public nuisance, with numerous accounts of drinking and fighting and so on. So it appears at one stage as well to have been used as a shambles or slaughterhouse, and that would account for the amount of animal bone that we found during the excavation. In 1888, 600 locals signed a petition calling for its removal, but this wasn't the only time resistance to its ex 
existence of courage. Um, so it's no exaggeration to say that just as the GPO became a symbol for the Easter Rising, the 1916 Rising, the market house became an inadvertent symbol of the struggle between landlord and tenant and between Protestantism and Catholicism, um, with the case for its removal spearheaded by church leaders as well as Matt Harris. Um, so he was the MP for County Galway and a leading Fenian. Um, I think he was originally from Roscommon but came to live in, in Banyan so. Um, both factions maintained that the market house had been built with the intention of obscuring the church from view and allegations of bigotry on the part of the Trancartis were frequent. So looking back at it with modern eyes, this is unlikely to have been the case, at least initially, um, as the market house originally formed the idealised, formed part of the idealised layout for a well-run town, although, although there does seem to have been some fairly strongly held beliefs on both sides. The campaign for its removal um, was as fruitless as it was tireless, and the market house remained standing for many years after that. But then, in the early 20th century, the local parish priest, uh, Father Joyce, took up the cause. And in September 1918, well over 30 years after uh, the initial campaign began, Father Joyce purchased the market house from the Clancarty estate and at the same time bought out the sitting tenants, so that was obviously a ward and so on. On January the 18th, 1919, he's called a Democrat report, which was the local newspaper. Um, it reported that work had begun on its demolition, and by the end of the month, the market house was no more. Its demise recounted in gleeful detail in the same newspaper on February the 1st. So I won't read out the whole quote, you can read it there yourselves, but I think what's really um, interesting about it is that it says, since the work on the tearing it down began on Monday morning, Father Joyce has been on the spot. So he just wasn't, wasn't leaving it, wasn't going to leave it until it was gone. Um, soon after that, the Market Square was officially renamed St. Michael's Square after the church, um, but it's still really referred to as the St. Michael's Square uh, locally. So another interesting find then, just that was found just really in front of, of the site of the Market House, um, was this well. And we, we have known of its existence either. So it's a subsurface stone well with a lead pump mechanism and it was complete with an intact plug. So that was found at the top of the square, as I said, sort of the, the junction of the top of the square in Dunlow Street. Um, so it's probably easier just to describe it to you. So the upper level of the well, when we, we took the ground off and we took the, the street layer off, the upper le level of the well was sealed by a rectangular block of limestone masonry. So it was covered over, and that's in contrast to the one that we found in Society Street, which had been backfilled. So under the, the limestone, under the cover, there was a grate. Um, the opening was about a metre wide, and um, we, could, we could see that the well was constructed. Um, it was again from angular limestone rubber, so limestone blocks, built to force the space of the wind of the world. Um, there's some evidence of repair and stuff like that. Um, but what's absolutely remarkable about it is that it's five point two inches deep and it's a slow cover of its smooth. There's nothing in it. Um, so well, the mechanism were the remains of a hand powered water pump, sometimes referred to as a parish pump. And they were a common sight in Ireland before um, Maine's water um, became the norm. Its period of use is likely to have been short lived as it's not, re it's not recorded on any of the early maps, um, you know, the Ordnance Survey maps, and it may be contemporary with the first phase of the market house in the late 1700s. And that's because I think that because it was literally um, plumped in the middle of the road. Um, so, what we're going to do now is, after just um, discussing all of that, um, so we're just going to have a look. It's a document there now, so far needs to come to change it. We're just going to have a look um, or a quick chat about Balmasso's architectural heritage um, because we're all familiar with the buildings on the streets. Um, but some of the features that I'm about to show you in these slides are things that you might pass every day without noticing and each of them kind of contributes um, to the town in their own small way. Okay, so as I said, we're just going to take a very quick look. I just want to move them as quickly as possible. Thanks very much. Um, so these are, you probably know yourselves, they're jostled stones or clean stones, they're known as as well. 
So they were used to protect the corners and the sides of buildings um, from damage from uh, car uh, carriage wheels. So usually you find either side of the carriage arch. Um, so there are plenty of carriage arches uh, around the town. So what you have in that slide there is one of the earliest examples and then a later one. So the one on the left is the earliest example that, was, that is located outside what was Kelso's. And it's absolutely beautifully made, um, really well made and expensively made as well. The base of the stone, which actually was hidden and would have been hidden, was made um, from a chamfered stone. It's really beautifully decorated as well. And that's, as I said, quite an early one. That, that could date the, the late 1700s. The other one is one of a pair that's found either side of the arch going into the guard station. Um, it's hexagonal in form, and it's much later. I think the guard station, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that was built in the 1840s. So that's contemporary with that. So the next ones then are, um, one of them is outside greens. So, uh, yeah, so the one on the left is, is found outside Green's archway, and the one on the right then is outside John Cavett's there on Society Street. Um, the John Cavett's one is actually one of the pair, but the second one has actually been moved into, into the, the arch itself. It's no longer outside. Um, and the thing about it is that each carriage arch in the town, and there are numerous carriage arches, would have had these on either side, but because I suppose they're subject to damage or they're in the way, you know, as cars have bigger and all the rest of it, they're removed uh, and, and don't. Um, so it's just nice to see that some of them uh, have survived. And it's really the kind of reflect a period of time. Uh, they, they reflect a period of time. So the next one then, Bernie, yeah, thanks, is um, a keystone. You're probably all familiar with this as well. This is outside Duane's Archway, or what was Duane's Archway there, um, at the junction of Society Street and Main Street. It's just over the archway, and it's dated uh, 1783, and the initials E.G. are written on it. And it's one, there's, there's, there's actually two in that area, um, but it's nice to have it. And of course you know as well that the, the, the buildings down the back of that, we spoke about this at the last talk, but it's likely that they're, they're late medieval in date uh, down behind it. So this is one of my favourites. This is a, a chimney plaque. So a number of these survive as well, particularly on Society Street, um, just down there at the bottom of Society Street, um, kind of at the junction of the three streets. Um, so chimney plaques, they were kind of, um, you know, I suppose a, a trademark or a stamp of a builder. Um, so you can see on that one, it reads Leonard Finn, 1816. So it indicates the, the date of the building. That's, I think that's Ryan's. Um, Hope oh, that's over. But you can see there's three or four of them in that area and they're all different dates. And one of the earliest ones I think is 1800 or 1801. Um, yeah. So it's actually Breach's brother who took that photograph on as well. Okay, sorry again. Yeah, so this is something now, um, regrettably these didn't survive um, the, the project because they were just, you know, um, the street level was, was um, brought up. But this is a very early copper layer on Main Street. It's just kind of opposite Flanagan's chemist. Um, now I think that, that that particular section of that, it ties in with an early 17th century layer that we found a street layer. So I think that those copper date to that time as well. Um, and again, just been hand laid, just basically a street surface. But kind of interesting to know the, the people were there at the time. So the next one there, Bernie. Yeah, so this is Rockwell's Arch on Dunlow Street, um, just beside the, the, the uh, dentist. So these are kind of interesting as well. You can see uh, the insert in the wall is for a lamp or a candle um, inside the arch. Um, so it's a lamp insert. And then on the base, you can see uh, there's a pivot stone or a spoke stone, they're also known as. Um, and that would have indicated that there was a gate or a um, uh, a door, I suppose, essentially, and um, that it would, the arch would have been, it, you would have been able to close over the arch at one stage. Um, and you can see that the, 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 uh, the interior of the archway would have been uh, cobbled as well. And actually, there's a very good example of one that has been restored um, there beside the Barwon Racing, I think it is, on Society Street, and they've restored uh, the cobbles in there. So the next one there. So that's just a detail of it. You can actually see, if you look at the spud stone on top, you might be able to pick out the swivel marks 
that the gate made, um, but it didn't pull kind of cleanly on it. it. It left a mark every time. Yeah, now so these are kind of things that I think should be protected as well. Um, so this is um, a boot scraper. Um, and that particular one is um, outside what was Chris Daly's there on Dunlow Street. It's just on the step. Um, so these modest and barely noticeable features, they reflect a wider social history. Um, they were a common feature around Europe from the early 18th century onwards. And they were originally known as a décoratoire, which translates as an excrement remover. Their appearance, their appearance marked the beginning of the fashion among the upper classes for walking or promenading along the streets of the, town, of the towns and cities, um, which until then had been kind of the, the domain of the poor. So the next one then is one that we found dumped in the backfill of one of the streets. I think that was actually found near Golan's on Main Street. And the other one then is outside McCullough's, and that's a fabulous example. Uh, really early, nice early Georgian uh, decoration on it. So that was, that's still in situ, but now we had to take it up when we were doing the paving, and we restored it actually and put it back in. But it's, it's a really, really nice example. The maker's mark is on that as well, but I forget who did it. So I'm just going to show you now, I just genuinely hope that the people who own these buildings don't mind them being photographed and shown here, but it really is just to illustrate the um, extensive kind of architectural heritage that we have in the town. Um, uh, so we're going to take a look at some of the door cases and door furniture um, and the stonework here. So before 1800, um, there was no such thing as you know brass door knockers or anything like that. But after that, it became fashionable, and brass became the method of choice. So walking around the town, you can see on the few surviving historic doors, um, you can see how the different designs changed in line with um, sort of movements in art as well. So you see some Georgian ones, you can see some Art Deco or Celtic revival ones. So I like John Cavill's door here um, on, the, on the left. Uh, you can see that the door and the door case kind of, they're, they're quite sympathetic to each other and the door furniture on it. And then this is McCullough's as well where we found the uh, boot scraper. And you can see this lovely um, stonework um, on the door case itself, some lovely rosettes. So I think that uh, house was built about 1810 as well. Um, if you just go to the next one, we're going sorry, yeah. So this is from Dooley's, just up at the corner, and you can see that that's Celtic Revival. So the, the use of these Celtic uh, decorations, um, you know, they're part, they're interesting because they formed part of the identity of the emerging state as well. So that dates to around 19, whatever, 19, kind of 10, around that time. So, um, yeah, I wanted to show you this as well because Alan Slow, as you know, is famous for stone and stone workers and, you know, the families of those stone masons that built those houses or, you know, um, they're, they're, they're still living in the town. 